I want to introduce Keith Tusi from Pittsburgh area. Uh, is a uh, he was a keynote speaker last night at the uh, pregnancy options gala. If you missed it, it's online. You can go online and see see it again, right? And so. And if you weren't able to go to it last night and you'd like to give financially to it, I encourage you to support our local pro-life pregnancy center. Um, Gina shared last night, and uh, it is just a, a ministry that is making a difference and saving lives in our community. I would encourage you to give financially to that and, and just see what God is doing and learn of it, and invite a friend, invite a friend to help support. We had a great turnout, even with all that's going on last night, and, and really good support was shown. So I wanna, and so Keith spoke there, and gave some, uh, Keith is a man who's been to some, God has given you some crazy experiences, and crazy opportunities worldwide, and we are honored to have him as, as the, key overseer of the network of related pastors that we're connected to. It's about 50-ish, somewhere in there, 50 churches or so nationwide. And I just so appreciate Keith's wisdom, his insight, his love for the word, and his love for the body of Christ, and the support that he and others through the, the network support us all um, as, as leaders of this local church to help us be the best we can be and have helped us greatly in a lot of, a lot of levels. Um, if you'd like to give financially um, to Keith and his ministry, he, this is all he does. He used to be pastoring. He used to be president of Operation Rescue for four years. Uh, now he travels to a lot of the churches in the network uh, and just encourages and builds up. And he and his wife have eight children and 13 grandchildren. Uh, and so he could use the help anyway. So... Um, a lot of grandkid, Christmas time must be a crazy time. So um, give Keith Tusi a warm Faribault River Church welcome. Come on up, Keith. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Yeah, we moved uh, our household about a year and a half ago and two of my sons are on one side of us their homes and my daughter is on the other side of us so we have eight grandchildren there now and then, of course then you know my two daughters-in-law and a son-in-law and I said to Penny our grocery bill has really gone up <laughs> it's like having kids again you know I remember those days uh, and she said, well, what are you going to do? I said, no, nah, I enjoy it. I said, just when I'm gone, just leave something for me when I come home. But anyway, uh, we did have a great time at the Band of Brothers. And, of course, uh, the River Church had a great showing. And Pastor Tony and the worship team just were, uh, you know, the talk of the town. I could just say that the churches just really responded. Pastor Tony did a great job. You know, I just want to say this about this guy here, Tony, Pastor Tony. It is so... I mean, you, you know the quality of man he is and his family, but, you know, from an overseeing perspective of somebody who's kind of directing things, having people that you totally trust is just the greatest joy in the world. And I, and I just don't even flinch when I know he's got it, you know. I know it's, he's going to do his job and he's going to work with his team and he's, that's come down river, you know, and it soaks into them. We had a gentleman from Pittsburgh who's from India. He's an executive and is working in Pittsburgh for a couple years. And he attended the conference, and this was his comment. Seeing those young men gave me hope for America. <laughs> so I thought, well, that pretty much sums it up. But to all those... One adjustment here. There. Is that better? Okay. So we, we did have a great time. Those teachings will be up on, our, I guess, the NRP web this week. And uh, as Pastor Steve mentioned, the gala message is out there last night. If you are a supporter, then I would encourage you to take that message, share it with people, you know. If you're not a supporter, listen to it and become a supporter. Amen. Amen. Not real complicated. So I want to take this morning and really address a subject that I think really, really needs addressing in the body of Christ, and that is how 
the American church interprets Romans 13. I think we really need a biblical look rather than a cultural look at Romans 13. So I want to read those 14 verses. It's a short chapter. Read those 14 verses. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And uh, I'm going to ask and answer a couple questions, but I want to encourage you to be Bereans and really look at what this scripture is saying and what it's not saying. So let's go to Romans 13, starting in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. For if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing that the time is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, the day is near, therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. I wanted to take a moment and read that whole chapter because I want to really put it in the context that it's designed to do. You know, early in my ministry life, I had the uh, opportunity, if you could call it that, to find myself behind what was then the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union. And I met with many believers who had already spent time in jail, young ladies in their teenage years who had spent time in jail for teaching Sunday school classes. One of the greatest impacts of my life was a, a Ukrainian man. He was actually Polish but was born and raised in uh, the Ukraine. His name was Ivan Lubchenko. Ivan spent 25 years in his life in jail in the Russian gulag for preaching the gospel. Three separate jail sentences. They'd put him in jail, he'd get out, he'd preach the gospel. They'd put him in jail, he'd get out, he'd preach the gospel. And, of course, when you're sitting and you're talking to somebody of that stature, you know, you, you need to have your thinking cap on. Yeah. And uh, he asked me a lot of very interesting questions. And, of course, one of the things that I found out real quick was that a lot of what we do in the American church is very ethnocentric. In other words, we take the scriptures and we baptize them in our experience in an American worldview rather than a Christian worldview. And I think none stood out to me stronger as to how people who had been persecuted, had spent time in jail, had lived under tyrannical regimes, how they saw this set of scriptures as opposed to how Americans saw this set of scriptures. And so then it begs the difference, well, what, what is the contextual teaching of the scripture and what is it really saying so as a result of that uh, I, I gained, a, gained a great appreciation for what I think is really being said here and I want to share that with you this morning okay so I'm going to make three statements to you and in my message today I'm going to go back and try to back those statements up and I encourage you to you to have your thinking cap on for you to make notes and you go home and study and see if these things are not true so number one Okay, Romans 13 does not suggest obedience to undelegated authority. 
There's nowhere in this passage where it suggests that any believer or any church should have obedience to undelegated authority. Here's something the Lord taught me a long time ago. Unless ultimate allegiance is expected, absolute obedience cannot be required. So here would be another question. Is there anywhere in the Scripture that you can find that God tolerates anybody else asking for our complete allegiance but himself in his spirit? So if ultimate allegiance is not expected, absolute obedience could not be required. Only God requires the absolute allegiance of our heart. And at the end of the day, it's only Him that can require absolute obedience. There are people, our institutions, uh, even civil government, that can require obedience to us, okay? But not absolute obedience, okay? Uh, not undefined obedience. So Romans 13, number one, does not suggest obedience to undelegated or abusive authority, very clearly. Number two, the subject of Romans 13, are you ready for this, is not civil government. It's God's government. Civil government is used in Romans 13 as an illustration. Like, for instance, if you read Ephesians 5, where it talks about Christ and the church, he uses marriage as an illustration. Remember that passage? Well, marriage is not the subject of Romans 5. We get marriage teaching out of it, and that's legitimate. But the subject of Ephesians 5 is Christ and his church. Well, this is the same exact scenario. This is talking about Christ and his church and using civil government partly as an illustration to help us understand because there was great confusion, especially in the Roman church, specifically in the Roman church, as to how they should relate to civil government. There was a lot of tension that was going on that we're going to cover here a little bit. The third statement I'd like to say to you is Romans 13 focus is not on law or laws. It's actually on relationships, believe it or not. And I'm going to unfold that to you by the grace of God and help you to appreciate that. So let's look at that last statement I made first. Let's look at that point number three, that Romans 13 is about relationships. Now here's the most remarkable thing about Romans 13 you're ever going to learn. It comes in between Romans 12 and Romans 14. <laughs> Those numbers really mean something. There is a sequence called a context. And so sometimes when you're reading something, like when you're reading a legal document, you know, uh, you know, I've been in court a few times, especially on constitutional issues. You know, I've had two, two of my cases have gone to the United States Supreme Court, and we've won both times on free speech cases. And it's interesting when the lawyers argue, you know, it's the one, really, the ability to contextualize the law that they are citing, is, it, that's the spoils of the victor, Okay. What did that mean when it was written? What was its original intent? What was said before? What was said after it? You know, it's, it's like taking something or misquoting something. We, we see this happen a lot. Well, sometimes in our ethnic-centric interpretations, we pull scriptures out of context, and we get a, a, maybe a principle of truth, but not the whole power of that truth, okay? So I want to show you how important it is to connect Romans 13 to its context, you know, the neighborhood that it's living in. So I'm just going to give you a few scriptures from Romans, thir or from Romans 12 and Romans 14. We're going to make a, a, a gospel sandwich here, okay? So let's look at Romans 12, and I'll give you uh, three scriptures from each, and you can, this afternoon or whenever you get time to spend time with the Lord, and you just read those whole chapters, okay? But let's look at Romans 12, 3. Romans 12, 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as, as sound judgment, as God has lauded to each a measure of faith. I, I'd say that's talking about relationships. How about you? Pretty clearly. How about Romans 12, 16? Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. I, I think that's pretty it's talking about how we esteem and treat people. It's talking about relationships, isn't it? How about Romans 12, 21? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a summation of it. Now look at Romans 14. 
Okay, we'll go to the other side of Romans 13. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Okay, that's pretty much, that's relationship, isn't it? All right, uh, how about this? But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Uh, I think it's talking about relationships in my book. How about you? Now, it's interesting that these couple verses talk about judging. And again, here's an American misnomer, okay? The Bible doesn't say that as believers, we cannot pass judgment. That's not even suggested. What it does say is that we cannot pass our own judgments. The Bible is full of God's judgments. And if we are his ambassadors, we should have the same judgment. When we say that, like for instance, homosexuality is a sin or sex outside of a man and a woman being married together is a sin, that's not my judgment. That's God's judgment. Now, if I deny God's judgment, now I've judged God. So there are literally believers who are paralyzed by unbiblical thinking who think they are judging somebody if they just tell them the judgment that God has already said. In actuality, what they're doing is they're judging God because they're not, being, they're not saying what God said. Okay? So when he's talking about judging and you not judging, he's talking about you giving credence to your opinions as opposed to the law of God. It's got to be very clear. All right? So then verse 19, So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. So I think when you read these chapters, you really undersee, in, in, in the book of Romans, a, a lot of it really has to do with the tension that was between the Jews and the Gentiles that were going on at the time. And there was a lot of tension between those group, two groups, especially in Rome. So there's a lot of teaching here as to how to get along and what to do. All right? So we have to understand that. Now, let's go back to Romans 13, 1 through 3. It says, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, this is a cornerstone of Christian belief. And I put it this way. When I teach on the, on the Christian worldview, what my first point is this, that all authority is delegated authority. Okay? A pastor has authority, But he has delegated authority. He doesn't have authority to do whatever he wants, however he wants. It's not his church. Okay? A husband has authority, but that authority is delegated authority. He can't do whatever he wants. He can only lead his wife in love, the Bible says. Hello? So that authority is delegated authority. Okay? Civil government has authority, but that authority is delegated authority. Okay? And actually... The Bible says very clearly when you read this passage that they have delegated authority to do good and not evil. He specifies it in this chapter. Hello? So that's the parameters of civil government. Therefore, I want to go over these verses. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now notice what it says here. Therefore, whoever resists authority. It doesn't say whoever resists a specific authority. He's talking about what we call antinomianism. He's talking about a mindset that's set into people where they have this nobody's going to tell me what to do attitude. Nobody's over me. Nobody can speak to me. Okay? Here he's talking, and this is very important to understand, he's talking about the principle of authority, not the personality of authority. So when someone is in government, okay, whether it's a husband or a pastor or the mayor or whoever it may be, it's not themselves they're representing, it's that office they're representing. It's not about the personality, okay, it's about the principle. And what he's doing here is he's challenging believers who have become worldly in their thinking and nobody's going to tell me what to do, okay? Now listen, this, this is very important for the body of Christ. Because you know, we got, we got people on the streets today that are riding and carrying on. They're antinomian. There is no law. There is nothing that is right or wrong. But you know, we have people that come to church 
that are baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and they're carrying the same Spirit. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And then they get mystical about it. They get spiritual. If you approach them with the Word of God, they just say, well, the Lord told me. That's antinomianism, when we're not subjected as believers to the Word of God. So he's talking about the uh, principle of authority, not the personality of authority. And so there's believers that get confused, and it's even taught from some American pulpits that who's ever in charge, that that's, that person is ordained of God. Not true. The principle of authority is ordained by God. The personality is not uh, ordained by God. Otherwise, we could never vote anybody out of office, or that would be sinning. We could never remove a pastor who is immoral, because that would be sinning. We could never tell a husband to separate from his wife if he was abusing her, because that would be immoral. Do you understand that? Because that, that would be carte blanche authority. We don't believe those things, okay? And that's certainly not what, this, what the Scripture teaches. So let's keep uh, rolling along here. So one of the questions that, you know, needs to be asked is, are, are we accountable to more than self? Do we make up the rules as we go? And if you look at uh, antinomianism, if you look at not immorality, but amorality, where there is no morality, it's people making up the rules they go. There is no authority over their life, okay? They, they will not accept that whatsoever. There's no one that governs me. There's no fixed point. There's no GPS. There's no true north. There's no absolute truth. And, of course, that's the cultural battle we're in. Now, to appreciate some of the things the Apostle Paul is writing, there's a verse in the 18th chapter of the book of Acts that is, a, that is an historical marker that's important for us to understand. So I want to go there real quick. Acts 18, verse 2. Maybe I didn't give that to you. Let me, let me get it. Eighteen verse two. Listen to what it says. And he found a Jew named Aquila. You, you remember uh, Priscilla and Aquila? They're prominent personalities in the Bible and the Scripture in the New Testament. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy, that's Rome, okay, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them. So what had happened was there was an exodus of Rome of the Jews, okay? And, uh, you know, if you go back, and I've done some historical research on it, it doesn't appear like there was any, like, one thing the Jews did. But Claudius had this tension with the Jews. And it wasn't like a whole purge. It was just like, if you're going to be a Jew in Rome, just don't, just don't be a Jew in public type of thing. It wasn't like where they were knocking on doors as far as you know and saying, if you're a Jew, you had to get out of town. It was like he was tired of the Jewish coalition and the tension that existed between them. And so that meant that the, the church that was in Rome that started out being very Jewish now, all the Jews were taken away and gone. And now we're in a time where the Jews have come back. Okay, so you start out with a scenario where you have a Jewish church. I think I have a slide there for it. And then you have a Gentile Jewish church. Okay, so there, there, there's a progression that's happened. So it had a Jewish beginning, and then during the growth period, you know, where you had Jews and Gentiles coming together. And again, you know, this should be very encouraging to us because there could not be any more racial division or cultural intolerance between two groups of people than Jews and Gentiles at this time. We have to com comprehend that Jesus preached such a radical message, and these people coming together to worship were like a sign and a wonder. This was an amazing thing. And so as the Apostle Paul is writing the book of Romans, he really wants to deal with this because he's saying to the church, you've got to get this right. You, this isn't just about your church. This is about, this is about the world. And praise be to God, one of the greatest accomplishments of the first century church, in a large part they conquered this. They got this right. And for the first time in world history, there were people of completely different tribes and kindreds and tongues and cultures that came together in one place to worship one God. It was a sign and a wonder. Hallelujah. And so the enemy always seeks to divide uh, God's people. So 
then you had the Jews were expelled, so now you had a Gentile church, and now you've got Jews returning at Paul's writing, and so now they're coming back into this tension. So they've, they've gone through all this stuff, and so he's writing them about authority. You know what he's really saying to them? Here's the Tusi version. Get the chip off your shoulder. Quit, quit just resisting for the sake of resisting. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a chip on your shoulder, but I've had a chip on my shoulder a few times. Like, you know, just like, like somebody tells you to do something, you just want to like, like, who, you know, you, that, that thing, that old man. Come on now, don't look at me in that tone of voice. I, 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 don't, I can see your halo, but I know that still comes. It, there's something in us that rises up, isn't it? And you know what the heart of God is saying? The heart of God is saying, listen, get under my authority completely. And the safest place for Mr. Keith to be is under the authority of God because when then when I'm under the authority of God, I can flow under his other delegated authority. When I'm not under his authority, then I have trouble flowing under other delegated authority. Okay, so when I see people that say they're Christians and they can't get along with other Christians They can't submit like to pastoral authority or people they're supposed to be working for even their bosses in many cases Hello, then I said wait a minute no matter what you say there is a problem of antinomianism in your heart that you've got to get conquered You've really got to come under the government of Jesus Christ this is a real heart issue he's dealing with. And it's really sad that we've so Americanized this, taken a couple verses out of context, and made it about submitting to the governor. When that was not its intent whatsoever. We are of the world, or in the world, but not of the world, excuse me. Amen? Hallelujah. And... Uh, we, we just got to understand what in the world is, is going on here. We got to, when we quote these scriptures, we need to understand why they were written and who they were written to and what we can learn from them. All authority is delegated authority. And what this passage is, it tells us about that delegation of civil government is that they, are, they have authority to execute good but not evil. Right? Now here's the next question. If that's true, and it is, because we just read it, who defines what good and evil is? Only God. One of, the, one of the key marks of a Christian worldview is God is the only just lawmaker. God is the only one that says what's right and wrong. Justice and righteousness go together. Justice is the execution of the goodness of God, but righteousness is God defining what's right. You can't have justice without righteousness. And only God defines what's right. Amen? Okay. So that is delegated authority that everybody is under, and we've got to see it very clearly, all right? Now, let's look at Romans 13, 4. Romans 13, 4. I might have skipped ahead there on some things, but... We got it? Okay. For he's talking about authority here now, and he says, for it is a minister. Notice he doesn't say they are a minister. It says it is a minister, because he's talking about the principle of authority, not the personality of authority. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. This is obviously a reference to civil government. But again, I believe it's just like Ephesians 5 where he's talking about Christ in the church and he's using marriage as an illustration for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So what he's saying to people is if you do what's right and you have good government, you should not be afraid of it because it does have a sword. It can, there are laws that it can enforce. And you know, you've probably run into some people who they don't, they don't think there should be any laws whatsoever, you know? Uh, you know, I've had discussions with people about, you know, I shouldn't have to get a driver's license because that's the state. Well, that's an interesting conversation. But quite frankly, when my wife and kids are out on the road, I'd like the next guy over to have a driver's license. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. I'd like there to be some rule. I think, I think that's a good law. Now, you might want to debate me about that, but for me, I like that law. It qualifies somebody, they won't be driving a 4,000 pound bullet toward my wife. All right? So there, there are good laws. So we should only be afraid of authority if we practice evil, if we have good authority. 
Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for what? For conscience sake. Because we don't want to walk around in life with a chip on our shoulder all the time. Just being that man, being that woman that's always got to have an objection, always got to have a different opinion, always got to have a little burr in our saddle. You've met people like that. Hopefully it's not that person you look at in the mirror, but you've met people like that. Okay? Then he goes, then he goes well, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit here, but, but let's go ahead and just go there to Romans 13, 7. Okay, now he gives a delineation. Now, again, remember, we read Romans 12, right? We read Romans 14. We'll work on our way through these verses. And so now, if you follow this, he's going to give like a color analysis to it. He's going to show you like, what does this look like? You know, one of the reasons I like the Bible is it just doesn't give us like a lot of what to do. It really gives you some color. It gives you what I call biography, Right? There's theology, and then there's biography, and biography should be his theology living through us, right? Like what we love and what we learn about Jesus, we start being like Jesus. It sounds like a pretty good goal to me. How about you? So now he starts giving us some color, some definition, some contrast on what this looks like. And here's what it looks like. Look at Romans 13, 7. Render to all what is due them, tax whom taxes due. Let's stop right there. I'd say he's probably talking about civil government, wouldn't you? Okay, I got no problem with that. Custom to whom custom. I don't know that he's talking about anything but the cultural differences that are between believers that are worshiping God. Custom to whom custom. You know, you have cu- like when you come, like when you come into our house, my wife says, "Would you take off your shoes?" That's the rule of our house. Okay. So when people walk in, they see the big trail of shoes, and they don't get it. We say, would you mind taking your shoes off? Okay? Some people don't take their shoes off. That's just our custom. It's not a law. We'll love you if you don't take your shoes off. If you don't take your shoes off, you're not going to hell. Okay? But that's our custom. Okay? And I don't want somebody to leave my house and say, well, the Tusis don't love people because they make them take their shoes off. That's our custom. And you know what he's saying? Listen, folks, get over it. And a lot of times what happens is people make dogma out of customs. Okay? Out of cultures. Can I just tell you something? Listen, this is a bomb. I want you to hear this. God is not looking for a multicultural church. He's looking for a one-culture church. He's looking for a multi-ethnic church, but a culture that is kingdom culture, where he makes the rules, he makes the laws. And I hear this multi-culture. I said, wait, wait, I'm confused about who the king is. He wants us to respect each other's customs, okay? If you're Polish, please keep making pierogies, Okay? Are you with me? If you're Italian, please keep making raviolis. If you're German, keep up the sauerkraut. Keep it flowing, okay? You don't give that up when you come into the kingdom. Actually, you should probably share it with me personally, okay? But there are customs that we turn into dogma, okay? And this goes back to the whole thing of reading Romans 12, coming into this, of respecting one another, embracing one another. He's saying to the Jews, you don't have to give up your Hebronic roots. He's saying to the Gentiles, Remember, there are many different versions of Gentiles, okay? All different ethnicities and everything. You don't have to stop being that, but you do have to be one in Christ. Okay? So he says, custom to whom custom, all right? Fear to whom fear. Now this, if anything else, and I've had some debates with people about, you know, this context of Scripture, the whole Romans 13 thing, and a lot of times I'll just jump right here to this phrase right here, fear to whom fear. I would say to them, sir or ma'am, is there any in the Bible that you are encouraged to fear anybody but God? Is there any realm or any evidence that God would encourage you to fear civil government? Absolutely not. Oh, if you're an evildoer, it says earlier, right? But fear to whom fear? Who are, we're ultimately to fear God. You know, in my ministry, I I think I kind of have a a courage anointing. But you know what I've learned about courage? The greatest thing I've learned about courage? Courage is simply knowing what to fear the most. (laughs) And if you fear God the most, it's amazing how you'll get courage sometimes. Just fear the Lord. Fear to whom fear. Remember who the king is, not a king is. 
right? Hallelujah. By the way, Ginsburg has found out that she was not on the Supreme Court. She was on a Supreme Court. Some of you are like, what did he say? Think about it. Now keep going. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. That's not talking about civil government, is it? He's breaking this down. He's taking the teaching from the beginning of Romans 13. Now he's breaking it down. He's saying, this is what this should look like in your life. This should be your attitude as a believer. This is how you should view authority. You should not walk around with a chip on your shoulder about authority all the time. Okay? Stay with me. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Okay, let's stop here. Give me a break. Is this talking about a civil law? Of course not. Oh, nothing to love any, but to love one another? For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. What law is he talking about? He's talking about the law of God, isn't he? Yeah. Romans 13 is talking about the law of God. It's talking about how believers relate to God's absolute edicts and commands. Now listen, I'm going to throw this in at no extra charge. I want to make sure you hear this, all right? That is measured in large part by how you relate to other authority. If a young person would come to me, and they have, and I just really want to serve Jesus, and you know, my mother, my father, wait, 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 wait stop right here. If you're under the authority of Jesus Christ, it's going to be reflected that you honor your mother and your father. Yeah. Okay? It's, I've had people come into the church that have gifts of ministry, but they can't submit to any one church or any one pastor. There's a problem there. That, no matter what they say. And, I ha and there are gifted people like that. They're not people, but they're gifted people. And to me, they are, they've disqualified themselves from ministry because of that. Because we have to love one another and esteem one another. You know what I used to tell my leadership team and, and the whole church that matter? I said, listen, our gifts may be different, our callings may be different, but in order to serve in this church, you've got to love God and you've got to love people. If you can't love God and love people, I don't care how gifted you are, you're disqualified. Yeah. And I realize we're all in progress to do that. Okay? We're all, we're all growing in that. Hopefully we're, we're growing. But he lays this down here. So listen, you got to get this right. You guys got to get this in-house thing right. You're fussing about the government, and you can't even get it right in the house of God. Woo! Hello? That's good preaching. Thank you, Pastor Keith. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> For this. Now listen, let, let's just make it real plain that he's talking about morality and spiritual integrity. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, it is some than this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Whose law is he talking about? Whose government is he talking about? He's talking about the law and the government of Almighty God. He's talking about the king and not a king. We have to see this. Because then when you run out of Romans 13 and you just run right into Romans 14 and you see it just picks up on this relational theme, it becomes very, very plain. And the question for the believer in this hour right now that we live in is very simply this. Or any hour we live in for that matter. Is Jesus Lord of our life? And what does that look like? Does it look like those verses I just read? Does it look like Romans 13, 7, 8, and 9? Does, is that what lordship looks like? If it doesn't look like that, or like we're not growing in that dimension of life, then that's not what lordship looks like. And he's saying to that Jew and Gentile church, if you are really under my lordship, coming under my government, that's going to start with how you relate to one another and how you honor the leadership that I put in the church. Because they were rebellious against any leadership that was in the church because they had that attitude about civil government now granted especially for the jews some of that was well earned <laughs> you know the romans weren't exactly you know the nicest people to work with at times but what he's saying is don't bring that into the church 
And a lot of times, you know, as a pastor and as a ministry leader, I'm dealing with people that have had a real experience with God, but yet they're bringing something in, okay? They're bringing a culture into the church that's a heathen culture. It's a natural, or I don't know if it's natural, but it, it, it's a systemic mindset against authority. And you've been around people like that. Don't be those people. He's talking here about the principle of authority, not the personality of authority. So when you look at people that are in office, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a husband, whether it's a governor, uh, you know, we've had these people throughout history that were wicked tyrants, that were not of God. God did not put them in office. The principle of authority God put but the vacuum was filled by somebody ungodly. Okay? Are you with me? And just like you may have a husband who's ungodly or even abusive, God doesn't do away with marriage, does he? Governments that are abusive and ungodly, God doesn't do away with government. You have, unfortunately, pastors who have, have been abusive and ungodly. God doesn't do away with pastoral ministry, does he? Because it's the principle of authority, not the personality of authority. And that we understand that all authority is delegated from God, and it is subject to God's rules and why and how God defines what is good and what God defines as evil. So when the government says, for instance, the church cannot meet together and it's not essential, that's not good by God's definition. Uh -huh. Okay, are you with me? They are outside their bounds. God has not given the king authority to govern the church. He's pretty jealous about this one. Hello? He's pretty jealous on this one. This is, you know, you've got to die to get a church. Are you with me? And there are some tensions there that sometimes we've got to work things out, but we've got to make sure it's it's related to our mission and not just our attitude hello and and my my thing is let's be as cooperative as we can without vacating our commandments and our calling i think that's a good place to be i think that's what romans 13 is teaching let's try to do the honor thing let's try to get along with people but let's remember who the king is in jesus name Amen. And that's really what he's calling them to do. You know, again, a summation would be, look, if you guys get the king right, you won't have so much fussing with a king. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand up together. The lordship of Jesus Christ. Is he Lord? He is Lord. He is Lord. He's not going to be Lord. You can't make him Lord. He was Lord before you ever thought of, okay? He is Lord. And that's the call to every believer. Are we subject to the rules and the dominion of his kingdom that we live in, in Jesus' name? So I just want to invite you just today to say, Lord, if there's a chip on my shoulder, if I, if, if I catch that thing rising up in me, am I, do I justify it or do I say, God, I just want to be under your government, God? I want to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. God is looking to show his glory on this planet, and that's going to come through the church. And to the degree that we can submit to him is directly in relation to the degree that we can shine the glory outside the walls of our own gathering. And it's so important that we take the flavor of this, the color of this, that conclusion he starts making in Romans 13, 7, 8, 9 about loving one another and honoring one another. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you for your reign. Thank you for your reign, Lord. Thank you for your reign in the name of Jesus over my life. I confess the lordship of Jesus Christ over everything I am and everything I not. Lord, over my thought life, over my desires, over my appetites, over my opinions, over my time, over my money, over my resources, over my gifts, over my circumstances. I confess that you are Lord, and I joyfully and willfully, by your grace, submit myself to your edicts, O oh God. 
because then we know freedom. Hallelujah. Then we're protected by the good king. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.